Hello and welcome to Eccentric Earth, the podcast where I, your host Amy Walker, delve into stories from across history with a guest who has no idea what the topic is going to be. Joining me this week is Holly Rose. Hi. Hello. Hi, thank you for joining us. No, this is great. I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to finding out some... See, because I I love history, but I feel like I have big gaps in my knowledge because obviously you can't know everything. It's physically impossible, but I do feel I'm a bit Eurocentric with what I know. So it's quite exciting. I feel like I'm going to learn something new. Hopefully. The pressure's on now if you're here to learn. It's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> we, we like to go for things that are a bit stranger, and history is definitely full of that. So hopefully it's uh, going to be something that will interest you. I'm sure it will. I'm one of those people. I'm like, wow, that's so new. More knowledge. Put it in my head. Put it in my head. <laughs> oh, then you're our target audience. <laughs> I, I quite frequently listen to things like the Museum of Curiosity and obviously they get the most random people on shows like that. So you just end up listening to someone who's like a neurosurgeon and then the next guest is a professor of like economic history of Africa or something like that. And you're like, wow, this is something I never thought I'd know about. And they explain something to you. It's really cool. So I like that. Cool. Awesome. I might have to check that out. Yeah, it's very good. So It's created by the same guy who made QI. So... So, okay, shall we uh, delve into this story that I've got for you? Yes, let's, let's go ahead. Victorian England has come to be a time that has been synonymous with fear, from the first publication of books such as Frankenstein and Dracula to the terror that Jack the Ripper would unleash upon the capital. The time period often brings to mind dark streets filled with unseen horrors. Some of the earliest cases of terror in the streets of England date back to 1803, and the Hammersmith murder case. From November 1803, a number of people in the Hammersmith area of West London claimed to have seen a ghost. Local people said that the ghost was of a man who had committed suicide the previous year. They said that he'd been buried in the Hammersmith churchyard. The contemporary belief at the time was that suicide victims should not be buried in consecrated ground, as their soul would not be at rest. Oh my gosh. So is he trying to get his rest? Oh my goodness! I feel like this is going to be a lot, like a lot more man- mundane than than the story at the end. It's going to just be some bloke in a hat, but I can get behind a bloke in a hat, scaring people. A bit of a Scooby Doo case, you think? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's not like all like all things in history that like spooky story, spooky story. Oh, actually, it was just a woman like who wore a different dress, and people got confused. The apparition was described as being very tall and dressed all in white, but was also said to wear chafskin garments with horns on some occasions. Stories about the ghost soon began to circulate. Two women, one elderly and the other pregnant, were reported to have been seized by the ghost on separate occasions whilst walking near the churchyard. Definitely slender man. <laughs> They were apparently so frightened they both died from shock a few days afterwards. I don't think you can die from shock, in, like, latterly. I feel like it's kind of a momentary thing, isn't it? Yeah, this is the Victorian age, though, so I'm guessing it yeah. was something else killed and they're just like, uh, shock. Yeah, that would do. Yeah. <laughs> they, they weren't big on the medical knowledge. Yeah. A brewer's servant... Thomas Groon later testified that whilst walking through the churchyard with a companion one night, something rose from behind a tombstone and seized him by the throat. Hearing the scuffle, his companion turned around, at which the ghost gave me a twist around and I saw nothing. I gave a bit of a push out with my fist and felt something soft like a great coat. Gosh. I honestly feel like I'd be, like, I wouldn't, if I was living in Hammersmith, I'd be like, no, 
No thanks. <laughs> I'm staying inside. There's this weirdo out there, and I'm not. I'm not really up for that. But then that's always the way in like ghost stories and stuff, isn't it? Like I'm, I'm watching the woman in white at the moment. And I'm just like, why are people like they know there's this weird mad lady running around? Why are you why are you actually looking for her? Why? <laughs> I've always found that really strange in these things. It's like, what are you doing? It's like even if you don't believe in ghosts, that there's someone out there doing stuff. Yeah, exactly. Don't don't be in that don't be in that person. On the twenty ninth of December, William Girdler, a night watchman, saw the ghost while near Brewer's Lane and gave chase. The apparition threw off its shroud and managed to escape. With London not having an organised police force at the time, several citizens formed armed patrols in the hopes of apprehending the ghost. At the corner of Beaver Lane, whilst making his rounds at around 10.30pm on the 3rd of January 1804, Girdler met one of the armed citizens patrolling the area, a 29-year-old excise officer called Francis Smith. Armed with a shotgun, Smith told him that he was going to look for the supposed ghost. Girdle agreed that he would join Smith after he called the hour at 11pm and that they would take the ghost if possible. I really don't see how a shotgun is going to help them in this situation. <laughs> if you truly believe it's a ghost, like, shotgun, not going to... Like, unless you're Sam and Dean and you've got, like, <laughs> a shotgun full of, like, um, what's it called, that the iron filings and salt that they carry around with them. Like, what is it, like, you know, are this, is this Victorian Sam and Dean? Because I could definitely get behind that. I'd watch that show. Like, supernatural, but, but Victorian. I'd definitely be watching that. <laughs> yeah, that would actually be really cool. At just past 11pm, Smith encountered a bricklayer, Thomas Millwood, who was wearing what were the normal clothing of the trade. He was described as wearing white linen trousers, washed very clean, a waistcoat of flannel, apparently new, very white, and an apron, which he wore around him also white, according to reports. Millwood had been heading home from a visit to his parents and sister, who lived in Black Lion Lane. According to his sister, immediately after seeing her brother off, she heard Smith yell at him, saying, Damn you, who are you and what are you? Damn you, I'll shoot you. After which, Smith shot him in the left of the lower jaw and killed him. Oh my God. See, it's just bad luck that someone's out looking for a ghost and you're out at night wearing all white yeah <laughs> no, that's just that's just gonna go badly wrong let's be honest yeah shot in the face pretty wrong <laughs> oh my god after hearing the shot girdler and smith's neighbor met smith who appeared very much agitated a short while later a constable arrived at the scene and took him into custody Millwood's corpse was carried to a local inn, where a surgeon examined the body and pronounced him dead as a result of a gunshot wound to the face. He said that the bullet had peppered him with small shot, one of which had penetrated the vertebrae of his neck and injured the spinal marrow. Millwood went on trial for killing Smith and ended up going to prison. The huge press around the incident, however, spread the news of the Hammersmith ghost around the country and cemented the idea of the supernatural in the public's imagination. Despite the Hammersmith ghost reappearing in 1824, no explanation was ever found for the mysterious sightings. In October 1837, a girl by the name of Mary Stevens was walking to Lavender Hill, where she was working as a servant after visiting her parents in Battersea. On her way through Clapham Common, a strange figure leapt at her from a dark alley. After immobilising her with a tight grip of the arms, he began to kiss her face, while ripping her clothes and touching her flesh with what were described as claws. I just think that's, like, obviously an awful experience for this young lady, but not a ghost, just just a, a normal human awful thing, um, le- mm-hmm. more less supernatural, more just weirdly rapey. Because um, I honestly don't think ghosts are that into that. Like, if you're dead... <laughs> Why would you? Why would you jump out on girls and like attack them? Like, it's, it's, you're surely going to be more into the like floating pots and pans and stuff, Malaki, because you're dead. Why at this point? What's there's no, and if you're like dead and Randy, then you're probably going to do the floating through walls into people's bathrooms and shit, aren't you? Not gonna like attack people. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm just like way too just thinking thinking this through way too much, and maybe some dead people are just as bad as. Alive people. 
True. Yeah. Although you never do, it's always ghosts getting randy with people. It's never, I walked into a haunted house and saw two ghosts doing each other kind of stories. No, like it's always like, I want to, uh, I want to be with that alive person. That personally, that makes me feel that that's not a ghost. Like mm. if I was a ghost, and there was another ghost, I'd be like, right, this seems to make more sense. We're kind of more compatible on a, like, ethereal plane kind of level, whereas not so much with humans anymore, because we're dead. So, you know, in, in the same way that, like, vampires with humans always go wrong, never work. So no matter how much you try, it's never going to work. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, the end of just got to stop trying. Dead people stick with dead people. That's the message yeah. of this podcast. Yeah, come on, like... I get it, you know, I, you're not undead, not, you know, undead, yes, and people know, I understand, you know, you're, you're still people, even if you're dead, but, you know, gotta, <laughs> gotta maybe think that there's some boundaries there, maybe some, like, issues with rotting flesh, or, you know, ghosts are meant to be quite cold, they right? you need to touch them, like, it would just be a whole thing, honestly. Sorry, I, I'm thinking into this way too much. <laughs> <laughs> Is... Is this the first time you thought about this? Because it sounds like it may have been something you've considered before. I read a lot of Terry Pratchett. I feel like this is something that has come out of that. Like, you know, people think about this stuff. So, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to blame Terry Pratchett for this. It's entirely his fault. He's not here to argue with me. So clearly it's his fault. You know. that, that is an acceptable defence. I will allow that. In her panic, Mary screamed, making the attacker quickly flee from the scene. The commotion brought several residents, who immediately launched a search for the aggressor, but nothing was found. The next day, the same figure was seen by another victim. Reportedly, he jumped in the way of a passing carriage, causing the coachman to lose control and crash, which resulted in severe injury to himself. Several witnesses claimed that the man escaped by jumping over a nine-foot wall. Gradually, the news of these strange incidents spread, and soon the press and public gave him the name spring Jack. Oh, I've heard of him. <laughs> I'm suddenly like, oh my god, I know this name, and I've never actually heard the story behind it. That's so cool. Yeah, I found this is one where it's like, a lot of people seem to know him, but don't know where he came from. Yeah, it's cool though. Yeah, I honestly thought he was just fictional. Because uh, so an acquaintance of mine runs a uh, an audio drama that's called Spring Hill Jack, and ah, it's cool. a, kind of about sort of this character. But um, and I feel bad because I've never actually listened to it properly. But I did support their Kickstarter, so I can't feel that bad. Uh, <laughs> like, they gave you money. Yeah. Um, I will give you money, but not my time. <laughs> yeah, like, I just don't have enough time, guys. Uh, <laughs> Come on. Um, yeah, and it's kind of interesting to hear where the name and stuff comes from, though. So that that's cool. Like, I'm I'm very excited. I feel like this is meeting of minds here. It's good. A few months after the first sightings, on the 9th of January 1838, the Lord Mayor of London, Sir John Cohen, revealed at a public session held in the Mansion House an anonymous complaint that he had been received several days earlier, which he had withheld in the hope of obtaining further information. The correspondent wrote, It appears that some individual, of as the writer believes the highest rank of life, have laid a wager with a mischievous and foolhardy companion, that he durst not take upon himself the task of visiting many of the villages near London in three different disguises, a ghost, a bear, and a devil, and moreover that he will enter a gentleman's garden for the purposes of alarming the inmates of the house. The wager has, however, been accepted, and the unmanly villain has succeeded in depriving several ladies of their senses, two of whom are not likely to recover, but to become burdens to their families. Oh my gosh. I feel like that's like old Victorian euphemism for he knocked him up. <laughs> it, it could be. that. Yeah. Well, he did, like you said, he got very rapey with that first woman, so... Yeah! I feel like this guy's just... Like sort of a serial and awful. Like let's maybe let's let's stick to the supernatural version of it. Like the other version is less fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's let's go back to the supernatural thing. Yeah. Ghost. Ghost scared people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the letter continued on to say, at one house, the man rang the bell, and on the servant coming to open the door, 
The brute stood in no less dreadful figure than a spectre clad most perfectly. The consequence was that the poor girl immediately swooned and has never from that moment been in her senses. The affair has now been going on for some time and strange to say the papers are still silent on the subject. The writer has reason to believe that they have the whole history at their fingers but through interested motives are induced to remain silent. Oh, so like, it's a whole conspiracy theory now. Like, we're at that point. Yeah, so they think the papers know something but are staying quiet. This just seems like... I know it's very different language, but it still seems like a very strange letter to send the mayor. Yeah. It feels like uh, one of those guys in, like, a Reddit forum. <laughs> Victorian Reddit forums, yes. That's, That's exactly what it is. What it is. <laughs> yeah. Victorian Reddit. You know, this is for people, like, I always imagine that, like, in ye olden times, that instead of, like, things like forums and, like, fanfic sites and all this sort of stuff, there was, like, a notice board down the bottom of a dark alley, and people would just go and pin stuff to it, and other people would come along and be like, oh, look, this person said, LOL, jokes, XD, 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 oh, ho, ho. you know, I just, that, maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just what I would like to happen. Again, I read a lot of Terry Pratchett, I feel like maybe this is informing my worldview. Well, you got to think as well, a time when they had no TV or any sort of entertainment like that, they had to get their kicks somehow. So, Oh, yeah, exactly. Writing weird shit to each other is probably very close to what they did. <laughs> yeah. I know that um, Jane Austen's family, or at least her nieces, used to write each other letters that were basically fanfic of Jane Austen's books. And they oh, would send that's them around. awesome. Yeah, like, that's quite a cool thing, so... Wow, I never knew that. That's really cool. I, I mean, I can't give you sources for that because I can't remember where exactly <laughs> I heard it. I feel like it was a conversation with a friend of mine who's like really into Jane Austen, so I might see if she knows. But that's definitely something. But yeah, it's quite interesting. The things you find that people did to amuse themselves. <laughs> like dressing up as ghosts in Victorian times. Yeah. Though the Lord Mayor seemed fairly sceptical, a member of the audience confirmed... Servant girls about Kensington, Hammersmith and Ealing tell dreadful stories of this ghost or devil. The Lord Mayor showed a crowded gathering a pile of letters from various places in and around London complaining of similar wicked pranks. The quantity of the letters that poured into Mansion House suggested that the stories were widespread in suburban London. One writer said several young women in Hammersmith had been frightened into dangerous fits and some severely wounded by a sort of claw that the miscreant wore on his hands. Another correspondent claimed that in Stockwell, Brixton, Camberwell and Vauxhall, several people had died of fright, and others had fits. Meanwhile, another reported that the trickster had been repeatedly seen in Lewisham and Blackheath. The Lord Mayor himself was in two minds about the affair. He thought the greatest exaggerations had been made, and that it is quite possible that the ghost performs the feats of a devil upon earth. But on the other hand, someone he trusted had told him of a servant girl in Forest Hill who had been scared into fits by a figure in bare skin. He was confident the person or persons involved in the pantomime display, as he called it, would be caught and punished. As such, police were instructed to search the, for individuals responsible, and rewards were offered. Even the Duke of Wellington, although aged nearly 70 at the time, went out at night on horseback armed with a rifle ready to hunt and kill the creature. It's changed from a ghost to a creature at this point. It's like people have acknowledged that it's got a physical body. Mm -hmm. I, think that, I always like that. I like how uh, stories and like folklore and stuff, especially in like Victorian times, the stories get twisted and twisted and twisted through gossip and all this sort of stuff. So it's interesting though. Yeah, especially how it's changed from a figure that's supposed to be quite spectral to now it's looking like a bear and um, there's another description a bit later on where it changed again so it's it's quite different and evolving so either it's public consciousness changing things or possibly it's just several different people dressed up and having fun kind of like when you had the clowns going around the other year scaring people yeah a peculiar report from the brighton gazette which appeared on the 14th of april 1838 edition of the times related how a gardener in Rosehill, Sussex, had been terrified by a creature of unknown nature. They wrote that Springhill Jack has, it seems, found his way to the Sussex coast. 
Even though the report bore little resemblance to other accounts of Jack, the incident occurred on the 13th of April, when it appeared to a gardener in the shape of a bear or some other four-footed animal. Having attacked the gardener's attention by growling, it then climbed the garden wall and ran along it on all fours, before jumping down and chasing the gardener for some time. After terrifying the gardener, the apparition scaled the wall and made its exit. Perhaps the best known of the alleged incidents involving spring Jack were the attacks on two teenage girls, Lucy Scales and Jane Alsop. The Alsop report was widely covered by the newspapers, including a piece in the Times, while fewer reports appeared in relation to the attack on Scales. The press coverage of these two attacks helped to raise the profile of spring Jack across Britain. Jane Alsop reported that on the 9th of the 19th of February 1938, sorry, 1838, she answered the door of her father's house to a man claiming to be a police officer who told her to bring a light because he had caught spring Jack. She brought the person a candle and noticed that he wore a large cloak. Dun, dun, dun. The moment she handed in the candle, however, he threw off the cloak and presented a most hideous and frightening appearance, she said. She claimed that he vomited blue and white flame from his mouth while his eyes resembled red balls of fire. Miss Allsop reported that he wore a large helmet and that his clothing, which appeared to be very tight-fitting, resembled white oil skin. Marvel villain now. I know, he's got a flaming head now. It's awesome. I know. <laughs> Ghost Rider. <gasps> Ghost Rider. <laughs> Victorian Ghost Rider. Again, it would be awesome. Yeah. Come on. I, I mean, like Neil Gaiman should be getting on this at this point. Like, come on. Without saying a word, he caught hold of her and began tearing at her gown with his claws, which she was certain were of some metallic substance. She screamed for help and managed to get away from him and ran towards the house. However, he caught her on the steps and tore her neck and arms with his claws. Fortunately, she was rescued by one of her sisters, after which the assailant fled. It's getting so dramatic. Eight days after the attack on Miss Allsop on 28th of Feb 1838, 18-year-old Lucy Scales and her sister were returning home after visiting their brother, who lived in a respectable part of Limehouse. Miss Scales stated in her deposition to the police that she and her sister were passing along Green Dragon Alley. She was walking in front of her sister at the time, and just as she came up upon the person, who was wearing a large cloak, he spurted a quantity of blue flame in her face, which deprived her of her sight, and so alarmed her that she instantly dropped to the ground and was seized with violent fits, which continued for several hours. Her brother added that on the evening in question, he had heard the loud screams of one of his sisters moments after they had left his house, and on running up the alley, he found his sister Lucy on the ground in a fit, with her sister attempting to hold and support her. She was taken home, and he then learnt that his other sister, he learnt from his other sister what had happened. She described Lucy's assailant as being a tall, thin, and, gent- and of gentlemanly appearance, covered in a large cloak, and carrying a small lamp or lantern similar to those used by police. The individual did not speak, nor did he try to lay his hands on them but instead walked quickly away. Every effort was made by the police to discover the author of these and similar outrages, and several persons were questioned, but those were set free. The Times reported that the alleged attack on Jane Allsop, under the heading The Late Outrage at Old Ford, this was something with an account of a trial of one Thomas Milbank, who immediately after the reported attack on Jane Allsop, had boasted in Morgan's arms that he was spring Jack. He was arrested and tried at Lambeth Street Court, the arresting officer was James Lee, who had earlier arrested William Corder, the Red Barn murderer. Milbank had been wearing white overalls and a greatcoat, which he dropped outside the house, and a candle he dropped was also found. He escaped conviction only because Jane Allsop insisted that her attacker breathed fire, and Milbank admitted he could do no such thing. <laughs> shockingly, shockingly, can't breathe fire. That, that's a great way to get away with something. It is, it's like... Well, you know, clearly I can't be fired, so it wasn't me, (laughs) you know. (laughs) It's not that, like, she's clearly exaggerating or, like, you know. This stuff is really interesting, especially with stuff like this, um, is people's memories of situations when that is informed by gossip and hearsay and rumour and all this sort of stuff Mm -hmm. get so twisted, especially in the kind of times before sorts of science and stuff, and we knew a lot more. People will be like, no, I definitely saw this. And you're like, 
well actually they probably could think they saw that because the human brain is so good at filling in the gaps that if you don't have things like science to you know tell you that what you've seen is clearly impossible you're going to believe it so you know i think that's quite interesting that likely she does think you know this girl did think that she saw someone breathe fire because she was scared and afraid and all this sort of stuff but actually no such thing happened but at the time people were like oh of course clearly someone's going to breathe fire it's makes you wonder who got away with what because of these things yeah definitely after these incidents spring jack became one of the most popular characters of the period his alleged exploits were reported in the newspapers and became the subject of several Penny Dreadfuls and plays performed in the cheap theatres. The devil was even renamed spring Jack in some Punch and Judy shows. <sighs> but even as his fame was growing, reports of spring Jack's appearances became less frequent, if not more widespread. In 1843, however, a wave of sightings swept the country again. A report from Northamptonshire described him as the very image of the devil himself with horns and eyes of flame. I like how this has gone from... Uh, we've definitely gone from ghost of man who committed suicide to the actual legitimate devil in, like, what, like 60 years or something? Like, <laughs> that's mad! Like, I, love, yeah. I, love, I love how humans work <laughs> and how they tell stories. It's great. Yeah, it's definitely not the result of exaggeration or retelling no. at all. <laughs> no, definitely not. Definitely true. Complete truth. Not some crazy like nut job who was running around on the moors one night and moors, whatever, hamster teeth and grabbed a girl. No, definitely not that. <laughs> Actually, the devil. In East Anglia, reports of attacks on drivers of mail coaches became quite common. In July 1847, a Spring Hill Jack investigation in the Tymouth area in Devon led to Captain Finch being convicted of two charges of assault against women, during which he is said to have been disguised in a skin coat, which had the appearance of a bullock's hide, skullcap, horns, and a mask. The legend was also linked with the phenomenon of devil footprints, which happened during the same period. In the beginning of the 1870s, spring Jack was reported again in several places distant from each other. In November of 1872, the News of the World reported that Peckham was in a state of commotion owing to what is known as the Peckham Ghost, a mysterious figure quite alarming in appearance. The editorial pointed out that it was none other than Spring Hill Jack who had terrified a past generation. Oh my gosh. Similar stories were published in the Illustrated Police News in April and May 1837. There were numerous sightings in Sheffield of the Park Ghost, which locals also came to identify as Spring Hill Jack. See, he's kind of now just become a part of folklore, hasn't he? He's no, he no longer has sort of any uh, basis in any sort of reality. It just become this figure that people talk about. That and that's really interesting. I mean, that's fascinating. How? Yeah. Sorry. I, I'm, for me, <laughs> as, like a writer, I find stories and stuff like this so interesting. That how things become part of sort of social consciousness, mm. and how humans rely so so strongly on stories to keep us going. I mean, it's why things like religion and stuff are so prevalent throughout all human history because we need to explain things and in most ways until we have science until we have sort of you know what we have nowadays and even now you know the stories behind things are what makes you so interested and passionate about things you know even science the theories that people come up with it's it's storytelling to a greater or lesser extent i mean yes there's lots of maths involved as well but the idea that someone went what if we put what if we could like actually get out and see what was in space you know, and it's because they're inspired to find out what's there and what the stories are there rather than, you know, and I think that's so interesting. I think that that's how humans work is this base level of ideas of social consciousness, social ideas and stories being passed around that inform us as people. So it's really interesting with this because that's basically showing that, showing how it's gone from a guy who was vaguely seen walking around in one area of London to suddenly become a countrywide thing of spring Hill Jack. It's the devil, you know, all these descriptions of him and all this sort of stuff. That's really interesting. Especially and this is the time before things like the internet and stuff, so this obviously it's taken mm. over. But it has essentially kind of and I hate it, but the idea it's basically become kind of a meme, but in a in the serious sense of the word, not in the internet sense of the word. Like this how things change and evolve and pass from person to person to person. 
that's what it is. It's so cool. So cool. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like picked, you picked the right topic for me. Like, this is interesting. This is great. I'm, I'm glad I did pick the right topic now. <laughs> yeah. In August 1877, one of the most notable reports about Spring Hill Jack came from a group of soldiers at Aldershot Barracks. This story went as follows. A sentry on duty in the North Camp peered into the darkness, his attention attracted by a peculiar figure advancing towards him. The soldier issued a challenge, which went unheeded, and the figure came up beside him and delivered several slaps to his face. A guard shot at him with no visible effect. Some sources claim that the soldier may have fired blanks at him, whilst others said that he missed or fired warning shots. The strange figure then disappeared into surrounding darkness with astonishing leaps and bounds. Got moon shoes on. You know, like, they, like in, is it the 80s when everyone had moon boots? Oh, yeah. So this guy was just a hundred years ahead of the time. Totally. He just had like big springy boots on to make him jump further. Or like those stilt things you can get. That's what he was doing. I just like the fact that he just walked up to a soldier and slapped him several times in the face. Yeah. It's just like, okay, wasn't what I was expecting when researching a apparent monster man, but sure. <laughs> it's great. The panic became so great at Aldershot that sentries were issued ammunition and ordered to shoot the night terror, as they called it, on sight. Following which the appearances ceased. Probably because some local person realised they were going to get shot and stop playing around. <laughs> Some believe that the appearances were actually pranks carried out by a fellow officer, a Lieutenant Alfrey. However, there is no record of Alfrey ever being court-martialed for the offence. In the autumn of 1877, Spring Hill Jack was reportedly seen at Newport Arch in Lincoln, wearing a sheepskin. An angry mob supposedly chased him and cornered him, and just as in Aldershot a while before, residents fired bullets at him with no effect. As usual, he was said to have made use of his leaping abilities to lose the crowd and disappear once again. See, now I'm just picturing someone on a pogo stick. <laughs> we're doing, we're doing, we're doing. It becomes a lot less scary when it's just a person with a pogo stick. A pogo stick wearing a terrible sheepskin rug. Yeah, exactly. It's just like, you know, someone who's gone out for a night out dressed as like Jon Snow from Game of Thrones. <laughs> with like an Ikea rug. <laughs> And, a po- and they, so they found a pogo stick, they've got drunk, and they're going around with, hey! That's clearly what this is. I, I think maybe this person was a time traveller who's just having a laugh. Well, like, if either of us ever end back in the Victorian times, we know what we've got to do. Yeah. We're going to just, like, go up to soldiers and slap them in the face. <laughs> like, oh, 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 I'm Spring Hill Jack! Ah. Run away. By the end of the 19th century, the reported sightings of Spring Hill Jack were moving towards the northwest of England. Around 1888, in Everton, North Liverpool, he allegedly appeared on the rooftop of St. Francis Xavier's Church in Salisbury Street. Oh, now he just wants to be in the X-Men, though. <laughs> He's just like, look, I've got superpowers. Look at me, I've got superpowers. Can I be in the X-Men? Oh, wait, this is not the right Xavier? All oh, right, OK, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Well, I'll he can off. leap and bullets don't affect him. I'd take him. Yeah. <laughs> Stick him on one of the B-teams. He'd, he'd do really well in like, X-Force or something, I think. In 1904, there were reports of appearances in a nearby William Henry Street in Liverpool. No one was ever caught and identified as Spring Hill Jack. This combined with an extraordinary abilities attributed to him and a very long period during which he reportedly at large has led to numerous and varied theories on his nature and identity. While several researchers seek a normal explanation for these events, some authors have explored more fantastic details of the story to propose different kinds of paranormal speculation. Skeptical investigators have dismissed the stories of Spring Hill Jack as mass hysteria, which developed around various stories of a bogeyman or devil which had been around for centuries, or from exaggerated urban myths about a man who clambered over rooftops claiming to be the devil. Other researchers believe that some individuals may have been behind the origin, being followed by imitators later on. Clearly, this uh, is Ezio Alatore di Firenze climbing around on people's roofs. <laughs> And people are like, oh my god, it's the devil. He's like, yes, totally believe that. Don't, I'm not an assassin. I am the devil. Yes. Oh no, it's Victorian England. Okay, so that's uh, the twins. What are they called? Uh, Jacob and. Oh, what's her name? 
Eevee, the Fry Twins. Yes. But yeah, no, it's the Saturns just like using this as a, a cover. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they weren't attacking people with claws. It could have been their hidden blades. Yeah, exactly. And actually, these people are like part of the Templar or just got in the way. Because I often end up killing random people in that game because they get in the way. <laughs> um, oh, no. See, now I want this to be part of Assassin's Creed lore because that would actually be awesome. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> it could work. It could. Either that or I'm just clearly just creating new stories in my head as we go along and be like, yeah, I should totally write this. Oh. Lots of fanfic coming our way. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, Spring Hill Jack was widely considered not to be a supernatural creature, but rather one or more persons with a macabre sense of humour. This idea matches the contents of the letters to Lord Mayor, which accuse a group of young aristocrats as the culprits. A popular rumour circulating as early as 1840 pointed to an Irish nobleman, the Marquis of Waterford, as the main suspect. Having suggested this may have been due to him having previously had experiences with women and police officers. The Marquis was frequently in the news in the late 1830s for drunken brawling, brutal jokes and vandalism, and was said to be willing to do anything for a bet. But clearly this guy is uh, the Bertie Worcester of his day. You know. <laughs> his irregular behaviour and his contempt for women earned him the title The Mad Marquis, and it was also known that he was in the London area by the time of the first incident. In 1880, he was named the perpetrator by E. Coblen Brewer, who said that the Marquis used to amuse himself by springing on travellers unawares to frighten them, and from time to time, others had followed his silly example. In 1842, the Marquis married and settled in Curramore House in County Waterford, and reportedly led an exemplary life until he died in a riding accident in 1859, which ruled him out as being responsible for later incidents. Skeptical investigators have asserted that the story of Spring Hill Jack was exaggerated and altered through mass hysteria, a process in which many sociological issues may have contributed. I agree with the skeptics, honestly. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably more that than an actual monster, I'd say. Yeah. I mean, it's nice, but, you know, I feel like humans are actually, at the end of the day, a bit generally scarier than monsters. Like, you know, werewolf just kind of doing what werewolves do. Weird ghosts creature devil man just doing what he's doing humans ah oh, fuck them mate oh am i allowed to swear sorry <laughs> yeah you're allowed to swear <laughs> yeah humans just like no screw humans humans are rubbish they just do shit and they hurt people it's bad you know these monsters got a reason they're a monster they just do what they do they just they just werewolf around they're not hurting nobody out they're not doing it on purpose they're just you know they're like well this is happening i'm sorry i can't help my werewolfy nature where were we? Oh, sociological issues. Uh, these include unsupported rumours, superstition, oral tradition, sensationalist publications, and a folklore rich in tales of fairies and strange roguish creatures. Gossip of alleged leaping and fire-spitting powers, his alleged extraordinary features, and his reputed skill at evading apprehension captured the minds of the superstitious public, increasingly so with the passing of time which gave the impression that spring Hill Jack had suffered no effects from ageing. As a result, a whole urban legend was built around the character, being reflected by contemporary publications. A variety of widely speculative paranormal explanations have also been proposed to explain the origin of spring Hill Jack, including that he was an extraterrestrial entity with non-human appearance and features, such as retro-reflective red eyes or phosphorus breath, and a superhuman ability derived from living on a high-gravity world, with his jumping ability and strange behaviour being explained away. Oh, he's an alien! Yep, there you go, another one, he's, he's an alien. He's a superman! <laughs> oh, I wasn't expecting the alien twist. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's just got me right there. That's exciting. Another theory put forward that he was in fact a demon, accidentally or purposefully summoned into this world by practitioners of the occult, or who made himself manifest simply to create spiritual turmoil. A number of authors, particularly Lauren Coleman and Jerome Clark, list Spring Hill Jack in a category named Phantom Attackers, with another well-known example being The Mad Gasser of Mattoon. I want to hear about him next. <laughs> that is a good one. 
I might I might do that one for you if you come on again. I feel like that should just be the category we do: phantom attackers and weird, <laughs> like supernatural entities. And just go, nah, it's clearly, clearly just a nutter. You know, <laughs> we just like be really cynical. Like, yeah. I find cynical is a good sort of default <laughs> format. <laughs> I like to call it realism. <laughs> Typical phantom attackers appear to be human and may be perceived as prosaic criminals, but may display extraordinary abilities, as in Spring Hill Jack's jumps which is widely noted would break the ankles of a human who replicated them and could not be caught by authorities. Victims commonly experience the attack in their bedrooms, homes or other seemingly secure enclosures. They may report being pinned or paralysed or on the other hand described as a siege in which they fought off a persistent intruder or intruders. Many reports can be readily be- many reports can readily be explained psychologically most notably the old hag phenomenon, reported in folklore and recognised by psychologists as a form of hallucination. In, a most, in most problematic cases, an attack is witnessed by several people and substantiated by some physical evidence, but the attacker cannot be verified to exist, as in Spring Hill Jack's case. The vast urban legend built around Spring Hill Jack influenced many aspects of Victorian life, especially in contemporary popular culture. For decades, especially in London, his name was equated with the boogeyman as a means of scaring children into behaving by telling them that if they were not good, spring Jack would leap up and peer in at them through their bedroom windows at night. Okay, that's quite creepy. I wouldn't want yeah. that. <laughs> that would get me to go to bed. Like, no! <laughs> with no real answers as to the identity or origins of this mysterious entity, It remains a mystery that may never be solved. Although I like the alien explanation. (laughs) I think so. I think think we should go with alien, not dissimilar to Superman. Because Superman's initial powers, he couldn't fly. He he could just jump over buildings. Like, he could just jump Mm -hmm. and he might. And then it it somehow became flying. So, basically, what he... When Superman's flying, what he's actually doing is just a really big jump. um, Is how it's explained in DC Comics. Uh, so maybe, maybe Spring Hill Jack is actually from Krypton. Yeah, maybe he doesn't... They said he had, like, blue fire. Maybe that's his frost breath and the red eyes yeah. is his laser eyes. He's just Superman. And, and he's bulletproof, apparently, so, yeah. Okay, so Spring maybe Hill Jack he's grabbing young ladies. I don't think he's Superman. I don't think Clark Kent's really into that. But maybe it's, like, Zod or somebody, you know. It's a really rapey Zod, Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I mean, Zod, that's, I would... that's my explanation done. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Spring Hill Jack actually just rapey, rapey Zod. You know, that's that's exactly what it is. Gets out the <laughs> Phantom Zone for a few days, bombs around London. And that's how you, he keeps turning up at like different time points and stuff. It's just the moments he manages to briefly escape the Phantom Zone before getting pulled back in again. Yeah, works we for me. We it. <laughs> Ta- take that, historians. We've come up with yeah. it in five minutes. Done. Boom. We don't need that evidence. Nah, evidence is for chumps. (laughs) This is fun. I enjoy this. Good. I'm glad you have. (laughs) Yeah. So if if people enjoyed this as well, where can they find you online and what what? Oh yeah. So if they if they like my my weird ramblings um, and kind of weird speculation about history. Um, yeah, I'm on Twitter, which, and I'm, oh, why didn't I choose a Twitter handle that you could just say and people would understand how you spell it? Um, <laughs> I'm at Littlest Prince, which is L-I-L-I-S-T, and then Prince, as in, you know, Purple Rain. Um, so Littlest Prince on Twitter, and then I'm the same on Instagram. Uh, but what's more interesting, especially on Instagram, is the Cosplay Journal, which is at the Cosplay Journal, which is a magazine that I am the editor, which is essentially uh, a cosplay and costume magazine for the UK. I say magazine, uh, it's more like, uh, it's sort of twice yearly, quite thick, chunky coffee table type thing. Um, but it's not a book, it's like halfway between the two. Um and in it, we kind of we want to talk about the diversity and the artistry in cosplay. So not just, 
I feel like there's a lot of people look at cosplay and go, oh, you're just dressed up as a comic book character and it's just sexy girls dressed as anime. And because that's kind of, I feel like unless you're inside the community, to a greater extent, that's all you get presented with. Whereas inside the community, there's a hugely, brilliantly, wonderful amount of cosplayers who are doing weird and wacky and brilliant things and it's all so crazy. And there's so many different types of people who are involved. And we don't, and we want to not only promote these people and be like, look at all the amazing people who are involved in this. Look at how broad and beautiful our rainbow spectrum of people is. Um, but also get people who might want to get involved in cosplay, but because of the general, uh, I suppose, the mass media version of cosplay, mm. where it is kind of you only see people like Jessica Negri and Yaya Han and all that sort of stuff, and they'll go, oh, I'm not pretty enough, or I'm not skinny enough, or I'm not, you know talented enough for any of these things and I want to be like no 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 person don't think this about yourself you are brilliant and you can definitely get involved like we want people to learn new skills and to get to you know think yes I can do this and to see the people in this magazine and go oh my god that person looks like me I can do this too like I think that's such an important message like we you know we champion uh, non-white cosplayers and disabled cosplayers uh, unfortunately, the fact that we have to champion plus size cosplayers because if you're bigger than a size zero, you're you shouldn't be cosplaying. Apparently, I had someone tell me I shouldn't be cosplaying, and I'm like a size ten. I, d- I don't even understand that. Like, what? Uh, yeah, that's that's makes no sense. <laughs> like, I'm tiny. I'm genuinely a tiny person, but whatever. Um, I don't think. You know, apparently, I'm not skinny enough. Ooh, body shaming whatever but you know uh, so cosplayers who are over 40 obviously I think there is a certain uh, idea that cosplaying is for teenagers and people's in, people in their 20s it's not at all loads of people do it well just do it their whole lives you know it's great lots of people started out in sort of the air the late 80s early 90s and are still doing it why should they stop they love it that's what it is and I genuinely believe that cosplay is for everyone everyone should get involved everyone should do it but I'm also a big believer in teaching skills to people because if you give a man a fish, he has a fish for a day. You teach a man to fish and he'll have fish forever and, you know, have a fulfilled and happy life where he has a skill and an ability where he doesn't feel like he's living off other people. Um, <laughs> no, that's not quite how positive works. But I do think that actually if you learn to sew, you'll be able to turn that pair of trousers up that you bought the other day and it doesn't quite fit you anymore. Or you'll be able to put a button back on a shirt or you maybe even decide to make your own clothes or make a dress or something like that, you know, and I think that's that's an amazing skill to have. And some people even, they get involved, they start learning these skills and they go on and it's their career, you know. So for me, I'm a fashion journalist and knowing how clothes are put together, knowing where they come from and understanding how it works has informed my career no end. So I might not be actively making costumes or making clothes for a living, but cosplaying as a whole and learning how to sew and how to make things and how to make props and stuff has meant that I now understand a lot more about the fashion industry and the industry I work in. Uh, and I think that's not, I don't think, see that as a bad thing. I don't, I know that some people will be like, oh, telling people to make their own stuff, that's so elitist of you, people can just buy it. And I'm like, yeah, if you want to just, that's fine. I'm not going to say it's a bad thing. It's not. If that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. And that's okay. Not everyone has the time, not everyone has the money. I understand that. I completely understand that. But, I would totally try, totally say that if you're thinking about buying an expensive costume, maybe take a moment and think how much would it cost me to go to a night class and learn how to sew? Or, and then how much money is that going to save me in the future? And the answer is none because cosplay is ludicrously expensive. But, (laughs) you know, you have a sense of purpose and achievement. I'm not selling this. But, um, (laughs) you know, I just feel like cosplayers get, you know, they're underrated as artists because just because a lot of the time, they are looking at somebody else's design and recreating it. Firstly, that's definitely not always the case. A lot of people design their own stuff or redesign things or change things. Uh, and secondly, just because you're looking at somebody else's design, so a drawing on a page that is two-dimensional, you've got to work out how to make that in 3D a lot of the time. Or if you see something in a film like Star Wars or whatever, you've got to go, how on earth did that person make that Stormtrooper armor? And you've got to think about how to do that Again, you you know, so I think that, I think there's a huge amount of skill and talent involved in it, uh, and it, like I said, it leads on to people going. A lot of people go on to work in theatre and film, and a lot of people go on to work in fashion, 
and others may go on to work as designers or uh, photographers. Loads of things come out of it. There's so much you can do. And it's just a wonderful community as well. I think there's a lot of love and a lot of passion involved in it. And we shouldn't disregard that just because it's a bit nerdy. I think there's a lot, as a hobby, I think there's a lot more skill and community and drive than there are in many, many hobbies, especially as adults. Mm. Because once you get past the point of, with like sport or anything like that, once you get past the point of you're not going to be a professional, you know, it doesn't have the same kind of level of drive. Whereas with cosplay, you you may not become a professional. It may just be your hobby, but that doesn't stop you from learning and building and getting better and better and better every time you do it. And I think that's brilliant. I think as a, a hobby that can better you as a person and better you in your life, that's great. That's really great, you know. So that's kind of what we're trying to promote. We're trying to, you know, get people involved who wouldn't necessarily think that they could do it, but they definitely can. Everybody can do it. Everyone can get involved. Everyone can find their own way of doing it and their own path and their own journey in cosplay, which is a bit pretentious, but whatever. Um, and I think that everybody is capable of learning and growing and all that stuff. And I think that's a very positive outlook to have for a magazine, because I think a lot of the time, especially fashion magazines and everything, are just going, oh, look at her, her boobs fell out of her top. Or, oh, cellulite, poke it, poke it. You know, we ain't doing that. We're going, everyone, all shapes, sizes, whatever, Colours, ethnicities, I don't care. You can look like whatever you want. I don't care as long as you are exciting and passionate and you want to do well in your life. That's what we want to promote. So I feel like we're super positive. <laughs> yeah, it it does sound awesome. I've been, it's something I've been aware of for a few months now, having followed you on social media and it is cool and exciting to see. And if people do follow you, on any of your online accounts they will get to see yes i talk about really creative cosplays yeah. and it's not just like a lot of the standard ones you see where it's a superhero outfit or something like that. you you get really creative especially with your your sewing and and yeah you'll show pictures i've got this fabric i'm going to turn it into this and you'll show people the stages and it's really interesting i don't like it when you just see that someone's gone i've got a cosplay Here's my cosplay. Here's my pictures of it finished. Like, that's fine. It's fine. There's no issue with it. But for me, the whole point is that you you're making it, and well, at least I'm making it, and I'm doing the the work, and I want to show that to people. I want to show them how I've done it and how I've gone from A to B, and like every little weird bit that's happened in the middle, because that's fascinating, isn't it? Just seeing how mm. it's made. So interesting. We never see that nowadays because everyone buys things off the rack. They don't make their own stuff. Nobody sees it. We've gone from a society where everyone knew exactly how to make a dress and a shirt and a pair of trousers and all this sort of stuff, because they had to, to nobody having a clue. And it's, you know, it's such a problem in fashion that you have loads and loads of people. Most people don't know how their clothes are put together and they don't know where they came from and they don't know what fabric it is they're wearing or any of this stuff. Um, I think that's really important, especially now we're thinking about sort of environmental things. The amount of, we can't just have disposable fashion anymore. We just can't. We need to We need to go backwards and we need to go back to the idea of slow fashion where it's, you make your own stuff or you recycle, you reuse, make, do, amend, all of this sort of stuff. It's so important that we do that. And that's why I, that's a massive part of what I, I show in my, in my accounts online and on my blog, which I'll go back to in a minute, um, is fashion and costume that is takes time to make and takes thought process and all this sort of stuff but at the end of it it's not going to fall apart it's going to last years and it's going to keep going and I think that's, that's a big deal right now when we're thinking about trying to save the environment you know the amount of energy and everything and man hours and the people who get abused and all this sort of stuff in these factories because we want another pair of jeans it's not sustainable and it's got to be we've got to start thinking about it um I'm actually going to big up the fashion revolution because that's definitely a blog and like a movement that people should be getting behind if this is something they, they are passionate about and we all should be. In the same way that we all don't want to, you know, everyone's stopping using plastic bags, we need to start thinking about things like Primark. And I get that money is an issue. I get that. And I get that not everyone can, you know, can afford to go and buy a pair of boots or something that's going to last them 10 years. 
because a pair of DMs is 120 quid. I get that. But as a society, as a whole, we need to start thinking about it and thinking how do we deal with this so that people who can't necessarily afford to do that don't feel left behind. And I don't have the answer to that, unfortunately, but I think a big part of it is starting to make your own stuff again. It is expecting to repair things again rather than just throwing them out. And I think it's, uh, you know, vintage is a massive part of that. Handing things down, wearing things at a second hand, not worrying about, oh, I got it in a charity shop or something. Charity shops are awesome. Charity shops, most of my clothes come from charity shops, you know. <laughs> uh, charity shops are handmade. That's how I live. So yeah, I think it's great. I think you can look great doing that. And we have become too obsessed with uh, fashion being disposable and you being less if you if you're buying stuff cheap from charity shops or from ebay or anything like that so yeah i think the vintage movement is actually doing a massive amount to help this because people are thinking about reusing stuff and what they can do like going into their parents um you know going into your parents stuff and looking at all that sort of thing so yeah it's great that's me that's my my little soapbox that I live on. Uh. No, it's it's good. You, you're clearly very, very passionate about it. And I think it's one of those things a lot of people probably wouldn't really think about initially. But, you know, it's you can get them interested in that. And, you know, if cosplay is the way they they break through into that, that's awesome because cosplay is awesome. It's fun. Come and be a geek and learn yeah, something exactly. and, and develop and... Yeah, check out the Cosplay Journal because it sounds absolutely awesome. It should be. It should be awesome. And we've just started, well, I have just started working on volume two because, uh, so I start thinking about the next volume about a month before everybody else. Uh, (laughs) So in like a month's time, I'll start being like, photographer, come here, photographer. We need to go do pictures. Uh, And they'll curse my name for the amount of photographs they have to take and edit. (laughs) Uh, and then I'll be like layout hello layout because I run the whole show for my sins and I really enjoy it I love what I do I'm not gonna say I love being an editor it's great and I love writing Uh, but it's like herding cats a lot of the time (laughs) (laughs) like oh my god where is this article why isn't it here why am I going mad ah where is this photograph why have you not got the photograph to go with the article ah you know uh, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. They're very good, <laughs> but I, my brain is just going a hundred miles an hour most of the time. So, yeah, it's fine. It's all good. It's all dandy. I think my laptop will be fine in a minute. Oh, I'm not sure that doesn't happen. Where's my cable? Ooh. Ooh. There we go. Save. Bye. Cool. Is there anything else that you wanted to promote as well? Uh, oh yeah, so my blog is uh, well, my blog where I write, so predominantly talk about fashion uh, on my blog, but I do also talk about costume design and cosplay on there as well. Um, but I run a blog for uh, well, I, it's about non-binary fashion and and not and I don't mean androgynous. I think a lot of people feel like I mean androgynous. I don't. I mean being non-binary and also being involved in fashion. And that does not mean you have to look like David Bowie or Tilda Swinton or any of these kind of hyper andro people. That is not what non-binary means. And I feel like lots of people think that. And so what I do is I talk about how, as a non-binary person, I interact with fashion and have found my way through that (coughs) and have found a way of presenting myself where I'm comfortable and happy with who I am without sort of... um, how to go like compromising my love for fashion and mm. my love for big poofy dresses because they're hyper feminine or like ridiculously tailored suits because they're hyper masculine. It's like, no, I don't want to compromise my love for either of these things because I love it all. I love all of this. But as an non-binary person, my clothes are just as non-binary as I am. You know, I'm wearing them. They're my clothes. So they're my gender that's on you if you don't think that you know not me so that's kind of what I talk about I talk about that a lot and I also have a bit of a uh, every so often I have a bit of a rant about costume design um or I talk about things like chap because I love chap fashion 
and I don't mean chap as in like cowboys I mean like boaters and uh, tweed jackets and top mm. hats and all that sort of stuff so uh, so I, I'm very into vintage so that's what I do in my real life is I write about vintage fashion and vintage lifestyle cool which is fun actually it's really fun I enjoy it I enjoy my life though it doesn't make a huge amount of money at the moment freelancing yay woo <laughs> Yeah, you one got, day, one day. got to do what you love, and hopefully, money will turn up at some point. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Do it. Do what you love, and everything will eventually come good. I hope. Anyway, but yeah, I think that's everything. Is that everything? Yeah. <laughs> Follow me on Twitter, and you'll get all of my nerd stuff anyway, because I promote everything on that, like including my Patreon. Because if you like, I'm not saying go follow my Patreon, guys, because you've only just met me, but. Um, if you like what I'm doing and you like the cosplay journal and stuff and you kind of follow me a bit on Twitter and then you'll see that I have a Patreon and you could maybe drop me some money on there. And if you do, you get some nice cosplay prints once a month. Ooh. Support me for $5 a month and you get cosplay prints. Woo, isn't that exciting? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, my Patreon's a bit, I'm a bit rubbish at updating it, but I do remember to send out rewards, so don't worry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I do remember to do that. The bit that that means that I am doing a photo shoot over this weekend, which is an exclusive for my Patreon. So if anyone's interested in my cosplay, that's where they get to see it now, because reach is awful. <sighs> cool. That's there a you whole go, people. Other... That's where you got to head now. Head over to Patreon. Oh, just head over to Twitter. Twitter is much better. I don't want people. To... I feel bad now. No, don't. Get to... <laughs> uh, just come follow me on Twitter. Just for my ramblings, because it's quite a lot of me rambling about gender and stuff but then I also because I'm a big nerd uh, I also talk about Star Wars a lot and I'll end up talking about the Avengers a lot as soon as uh, I feel like we can talk about it without spoiling it for people because um, I have a lot of opinions about that film <laughs> uh, I'm, I've been eagerly awaiting to see your opinions on it but like you said it's knowing we'll when we can talk <laughs> I, think, I think I'm going to give it a couple more weeks um, but I have like a lot and none of them are... I feel like I have completely different opinions than most people I've seen. And I'm there like, oh, it's going to get controversial, guys. It's going to get now, controversial. Now I'm um, really interested. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And, uh, yeah, so my, my Twitter, but I also talk a lot about fashion and I post all of my blog posts on that. So if people want to read my blog, that'll be my Twitter and my Instagram. Uh, yeah. But, yes, no, follow my, my Instagram and my Twitter both have the same handle, which is at Littlest Prince, so L-I-L-I-S-T Prince. Awesome. And if you enjoy this episode, you can follow us as well over on Twitter. Our handle is at eccentric underscore earth. You can also find us on Facebook by going to facebook facebook.com forward slash eccentric earth. And we're on Instagram as well. We try and keep all of our social media platforms up to date with news about upcoming shows and new releases as well as um, posting history facts about things that happened on that day in history we try and find weird and obscure things so if you're into your history go check that out and you can find the show on all major podcast providers and on youtube so make sure you subscribe or click the follow buttons so that you don't miss any episodes. And if you want to give us any feedback or suggest any future topics, our email address is eccentricearth at outlook.com. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on, Holly. I've had a lot Thank of fun you. with you on this topic. Fun. This has been so much fun. I've really enjoyed this. Good. I Like I said, I always get worried the first time I have someone on because I, I don't know their tastes yet, but... I think I lucked out with what I picked for you. Yeah. <laughs> but that's brilliant. And uh, thank you everyone for listening and we'll see you all next time. Bye. Bye.